Good morning, everybody. My name is Sarah Williams. I'm a foreign languages teacher, a specialist dyslexia teacher and assessor, and I'm head of student services at Christleton High School, which is in Chester, which, if you don't know, is northwest England. It's a lovely, lovely place. I'm really excited to be here today. A little bit nervous, too, but I'm actually excited to be here to share with you our exciting, our initial piece of work in applying lean successfully to education. As Nelson Mandela told us, education is the most powerful tool to change the world. It touches all of us. All of you here today know our business, the business of education. You yourselves have been to school. You may have children still in school. You see your next door neighbours or your relatives' children going off to school. You may be a school governor. You've got a school in your community. Well, as well as being really privileged to work in what can only be described as a, as a wonderful school, um, working with Toyota was a fascinating time and it inspired me to want to know more and more. As a result of that, I did some research about what universities possibly provided some courses on that and I'm now signed up, to, signed up at Buckingham University doing my Masters in Continuous Improvement in Public Service. What's been really interesting is that in my initial research is that through all the search engines, and good old Google, I've only managed to identify three other people established working with Lean in education. We've got Dan Florizon, who was just mentioned, from Saskatchewan. I'm in touch with a lady called Betty Zizowski, Zizowski who's over in Ohio, who has her own company, um, Lean Education Enterprise. And then there's Mike Rother, who lots of you will know, who's recently taken Carter in the classroom over to the Lean Educators Conference. I think I'm right in saying that it took Toyota in the region of 20, 25 years to refine their processes. We're at the end of year two, so it's definitely fair to say we are novices in the practice of applying Lean to education. However, what we've experienced so far and what we've achieved so far has been so exciting and so liberating that it's our intention to continue to build on our success and hopefully to incite you to want to become part of the journey taking Lean into education. I'm going to start by asking this question. As Lean practitioners, you all know really well that the critical starting point is to define Lean in your, sorry, to define value in your service. So that's the question. What does value in the public sector mean to you? Now I'm going to contextualise it into a personal situation which definitely enabled me to consider the definition of value. Meet Ted. I'm sure you're imagining who this person is. This is my younger son, Ted. The date? The date is not his birthday. Ted has recently already turned 14. The date is actually the date that Ted very nearly died. Ted had been born eight weeks premature. By the 27th of November, Ted was still effectively five weeks early and he weighed around five pounds. As you can imagine, it was one horrific day for us. It started with Ted stopping feeding and then stopping breathing. And laying in his little chair, his face, tiny face, literally changed from blue to yellow to pink to orange, any colour, just not normal. And it happened over and over again. This was every parent's nightmare. And the moments which ensued, the screaming, my screaming at the 999 operator, my desperate, desperate plea outside the house for the ambulance to please hurry up, the blue light journey to the Countess of Chester Hospital, the scenes in the resuscitation department with what felt like hundreds of people trying to save my baby's life, those moments will live with me forever. Later that day, unfortunately, Ted became really ill really quickly and a decision had to be made to take him overnight to North Staff's paediatric intensive care unit. In terms of considering services then, what services did we receive? We received a myriad of services. Was it value? There was no value stream mapping going on in my head, but was it value? When the ambulance arrived from North Staff's Hospital, in the ambulance came along the consultant and the senior sister. 
it was value. It felt really, really easy for me to divine value in health. It was a case of just save his life regardless. Regardless, that is, of how brain damaged he is. Whilst waiting around in the hospital, there felt like there was endless time to sit, to think, to pray. I was assuming that even if we were really lucky and Ted did survive, that he was probably, potentially, going to be very, very brain damaged. That didn't matter. Just save his life. I considered our future as a teacher. This is going to involve special school and how I was hoping bitterly that some school somewhere would be able to provide a special educational provision that would meet my son's needs, whatever they may be. Then eventually came the words that we all so desperately want to hear when our loved ones are ill. Ted's going to be fine, Mrs Williams. And even more wonderful, usually in these situations, there's no long-term brain damage. So to me, on a raw level, value was immense. I knew what value meant. His life was saved. And here he is today. Albeit a tinker, he attends our school. Does Ted have special educational needs? In my opinion, he's a contender for ADHD. We don't even know whether that exists. There's another story. So now, to come here, to come to what we're here for, to talk about value within mainstream special education. And value in education, of course, unlike my journey through the hospital for our family personally, the, value, the, the extended time is 14 years in education, a minimum of 14 years. So, I had to learn. Value is only meaningful when it is expressed by a specific service which meets, meets the customer's <coughs> needs. So we had to consider who are our customers, what are their needs, and indeed what represents value. 137 students at Christleton High School have complex learning difficulties which need our care and intervention on an individual basis. We have 11 students who have what's called um, a statement of educational need or more recently it's known as an educational health care plan and those students have additional monies personally for them which come into the school budget. But for today I've selected the three key strands of special educational needs which we are presented with at Christleton High School. Focusing on these strands, and if we consider it based on uh, current national t statistics, in terms of our audience today, and I've assumed approximately 200, it's possible, it's probable, that four of us may have ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Two of us, although I would suggest potentially more, will be on the autism spectrum. And up to 20 of us, you may or may not know, will be dyslexic, eight of whom will be severely dyslexic. And that's across spelling and or reading and or working memory. In addition to the students on our special educational needs register, the Student Services Department works intensely to support 22 vulnerable families who present on the local Safeguarding Children Board Continuum of Need. The continuum of need is a tool which enables professionals to determine how vulnerable a family is. As you can see, our lovely school in Chester, we have 22 students at level three and level four. In fact, last week, another two joined level three. At level three, those students require a multi-agency joined up approach. So that is your, your educational psychologist maybe, your occupational therapist, the mental health team, working with the school together to make sure that we meet the needs of those students. Interestingly, it's always the schools that lead them. That's not apparently how it is, but that is the case. At our school, we also have 11 students who really sadly and tragically in their lives, they've either already suffered significant harm or they're currently still suffering significant harm. And it's crucial that we work with the statutory services of children's social care to ensure that we meet their needs. And I'm really proud of what we do. I'm really fortunate. I absolutely love my job. I hope you can tell that. I absolutely love my job. And I go to school every single day, really happy. It's a really demanding job. 
but I touch children's lives and hopefully I change children's lives for the better every single day. My official title at Christleton High School, on my contract, is Head of Special Educational Needs and Personalisation, otherwise known as SENCO. Or, as was innocently, but very, very genuinely, read out at a parents' evening in front of lots of parents by one of our weaker students, who clearly hadn't benefited from any reading intervention we were doing, as Mrs Sarah Williams, psycho. He had extreme special needs. He did have a statement of special needs. And we couldn't meet his needs. And it was a real journey in persuading mum we couldn't meet his needs because she loved our school, the son loved our school. But Tony and I knew we, we, it wasn't fair to keep him with us. We had a gigantic battle to get him into a special school locally, where there are only 12 places in a year group. It turned out he didn't even live in the right authority. He lived in Flintshire, and the school was in Cheshire. Did we battle? Did we get him there? I have a letter of extreme success for this young guy who's just joined the sixth form now. It's a good decision. In addition to our um, students with special education needs and our vulnerable children and their families, we also provide a personalised service for our students who have English as additional language. And amongst many others, we also provide a personalised service for our gifted academy football players. They spend a lot of time backing into, into academies throughout the week and they need a reduced timetable, some of them. They come to our room, we make sure they keep up. Thus, my title isn't just head of special educational needs, I am head of a service to students. My principal role is essentially to ensure that as a school we meet the statutory duties contained within the Department for Education, Special, Edu Special Educational Needs Code of Practice 2015, and also the Department for Education statutory guidance, keeping children safe in education. The focus is always on high aspirations, improving outcomes, ensuring they succeed in education and ensuring a successful transition to adulthood. The guidance is also for close cooperation between education, health and social care. Essentially, the two key areas to my role Obviously, ensuring high standards of learning and achievement continually, to identify the students who have additional needs, to identify a programme of intervention to meet their needs, and to ensure that the intervention is having the required impact. Before I hand over to Tony, I would like you to personally hear from some of our Christleton High School customers. One day I would like to work with animals, otherwise I won't be happy. I have a diagnosis of Tourette's, ADHD and a statement of educational need. My Tourette's gets in the way at school and it makes me really stressed and frustrated. I often need support to get through it. There is always, a, some, there is always some, someone in student services to help me become calm again to work. The team support me to understand the work in some of my lessons, in particular maths and English, essentially to get good grades. They also support me to do my homework. They support me during breaks and lunches whenever I need someone to talk to. Student services is like my second home. My name is Peter. I am in year seven at Custon High School. When I leave school, I want to be an RVF pilot. I'm dyslexic. I go to student services nearly every day. Hi, my name is Matthew. I am in year 11 at Christon High School. I don't really know what I do, want to do when I leave school. I'm dyslexic. I go to student services every day. I have a reduced timetable and I'm supported to keep up with my work. Without the support of student services, I would find it really difficult to come into school. I may not even be able to come in. Good morning. Cheer up. Nobody dies. It's all right. They're all okay. <laughs> Relax. <laughs> um, schools are quite complicated, and what I want to just share a little bit is the, the complication uh, of the school as a business, and then we come back to how we've applied lean to student services and where we're going with it next. 
Uh, as a school, we start off, uh, somebody gives us some money, normally, uh, depending on who's in government at the moment, George and David argue, and we get a sum at the end of it, uh, which is broadly the nation divided by a fixed amount. That's what we've got to work with. So we grumble and moan and try and get extra bits, but basically we start off with a fixed amount of money. We take in variable units called children. Uh, there's lots of them. And we, we, have, uh, we just take the 200 nearest students who come into our school. We don't select. There are about seven or 800 apply, um, which is, is very flattering, but also quite upsetting, uh, because we've only got room for 200. So we, we take them. Then we've got to add value to all of them, regardless of their starting point, and taking into consideration their choices. And then they come out at the other end, if it's a factory model. Uh, there are perverse incentives. Uh, generally speaking, if you want more money, you need to do badly. So um, if, if, you really, you know, if you run a really bad school, you get enormous amounts of extra money. Um, and I think the, the gentleman from Spotify described it as inflicted help. Um, so you get people telling you how to do your job, but you get more resource for doing badly. So it's, it's a curious business. Uh, let's have a look at, uh, that's an interesting Google search, if you put bad school in, there's a lot of things come up under that, um, so it's interesting feedback as a, as a professional. Let's, let's take a so-called bad school. What a bad school does is take a group of students and do some things to them. So in year seven, you probably do maths to them and some English to them and other things, and then you might give them a very limited choice, so you can, depending on your surname, you'll do either French or Spanish. We still do the things like this in the English system. It's shocking. Um, so, so we do some things like that. Then they might get a little tiny bit of choice in year nine when they're about 14. We say, well, actually, you've got to do one of those, one of those, and one of those. Make your mind up quickly, but you might not get them if it doesn't fit the timetable. Uh, we force them to learn in a certain way. We talk at them, and then they come out at the end with some qualifications. So, so that, that's your bad school, if you like. And, and I have to say, I'm very, very proud of the English system, and there are very few of those left. A good school, then, let's see we're going up. Here we've got more choice. So you come in, we listen perhaps to some of what the students want, we consider their preferences, we consider their starting points. We might even do something as sophisticated as organising a transition programme, which takes into account previous learning, doesn't reset it, and builds on it. The choice will be more. So, and it will be rationalised and probably good advice will be given as well. If you do this, then that. Those sort of conversations that many of you already had in schools when you've sat at the careers evening as either a student or a parent. If we go on, this um, was written by Ofsted, this to almost exactly this time last year actually, about my school. Um, it was, it's a flattering statement. Uh, what I was quite, that's a bit like, I don't know if you know Ofsted, it's a bit like the health and safety telling you to take more risks at the end of a visit. You know, we, we were okay with that. We'll take that. We'll stick. Um, but for me as a head the following morning, it was quite, I was quite frightened by, I was a bit worried really because uh, are my staff going to sit back? Are they going to stay too long? Are they going to think they're it? They've got there. And I dashed around. You can just about get around the 100 classrooms in an hour's lesson. So I dashed in saying, thanks very much for bailing us out. You know, we've done well to everybody, kids and, and, and staff. And the whole school felt normal and OK. It was running as it should have done on a normal day, which sort of lowered my bl blood pressure a bit because it wasn't a, thank God they've gone, now we can put our feet up, which is, is always your fear in these circumstances. But our school is not good enough. Nothing like good enough. What I'm trying to say in a school like this and like ours is we do all of those things in a good school better. So, so we consider the children more. It's become more child-centred. And I think the analogy to lean for me is the transition from a bad school, so-called, which is pushing. It's manufacturing. A really good school is pulling through the system. So it's thinking about it. But a key question for us, we don't know the answer to it yet, is if you're pulling, should you be pulling from the end point? The obvious end point is you do some exams and you get some certificates. And, you know, we've got some KPIs there. You know, get some kids, hang on to them, make sure they don't leave, run away, escape. Um, you exclude them. Don't exclude children. We work through our problems. Then they get some results and everyone goes, they've got results. They've got a ticket for life, apparently, then. And then they go on somewhere and do something that adds value to our society. That's broadly the model and the KPIs. But where does the pull start from? 
You know, are we pulling from one year to the next? Are we walking right down here and saying, as employers, we sh you know, as, as educators, we should be preparing children for life. What does life look like? You know, what do you guys do? What do you want in your workplace? How are you telling us? How are we translating that into learning? When I've worked for, I think, 19 education ministers now, all of whom change everything just so they've left their mark. You know, it's a bit like having 19 cats go through your garden. <laughs> the business, then. That's, that's how the money's divvied up. We get some money, that's the cake, that's how it's sliced up. The key thing is there's been no surprises there. We know humans make a difference. That's, that's why you're all here. So we put all our money virtually into that. And teachers are expensive and they're, they're quite challenging to manage because they think they're always right. Um, whereas, in fact, a lot of the time they're wrong. <laughs> um, we're very data rich. Okay? These, the next three or four slides, we're just going to flick through. You can't read them, but they're in the, the pack or wherever you get them from. Um, these, these slides were generated by my achievements and care team. And what they do is they, they go into considerable detail. So these are looking at attendance, trend, date, time, even lesson. One of the advantages, our school's in a small village, so if they escape, they're pretty obvious. The post office rings us up and we go and fetch them. So we don't have some of the problems that I've had when I worked in inner city schools. But we still need to know that they're here, that people like yourselves are not taking holidays out of school time because they're a lot cheaper and more convenient. Uh, so we have to, to get on to you over that. I'm sure that's it. If you look at this one, this is a, I think it's quite interesting. Again, you may not be able to make it out, but there are two huge spikes in late for lesson. So we've got lesson by lesson monitoring. We wanted to know, we would come at it with neutral curiosity. Why? Why, why those two spikes? And then we start asking questions like this. So this came out, I was copied into the notes. These were the notes from the Achievement and Care meeting when they'd looked at the data. They were their thoughts. Now, many of you will be forming hypotheses. You know, this one's quite an interesting one, isn't it? Level of authorised absences in year eight. So that's parents being naughty, largely. Um, but why year eight? And it was, it was quite a spike. So we should approach learning and the business of learning and the school we're running with a curiosity that's driven by some fact, and we have got fact. It's not as soft as people like to make out. If you take a simple output, like, what are the signs? Somebody will say to me, oh, you must be busy at the moment because the exams are on, or how did you do in science? You can't answer that because we run all those sciences at GCSE, and some students will do three, two, or one of combinations of those. Some of them are A to C grades or A to, to E grades and so on. Some are graded past distinction, which has an equivalence. There's a decoding. So, so how do we do in science? Really difficult question to answer, actually. How are the science department doing? Well, like you'd expect, they're doing well and they're doing badly. Depends which bit you look at. And my job's to keep an eye on those trends, share those trends, and work with the science department so they've got cognizance. They know I know. They know. They understand, and they're trying to do something about it, and I'm helping resource it, either in terms of emotional support and encouragement, a bit of a kick, or some money, or consult, whatever it is we decide to do. That, then, is, is the sort of complexity of the model. Every, if your child comes into uh, to a lesson, they start off with a grade. There's a no-hiding point on it. So you start with a grade, and they go up and down. Uh, and the teachers do that. Parents can log on and look at that any time, which it sounds a bit scary, doesn't it, really? Unfortunately for us, what happens is the wrong parents do. So the parents who are on to us every day and interrogate their child when they get home track them all day on Lesson Monitor. And the ones we dearly love to be looking at Lesson Monitor, not so they can tell them off, but so they can say, what happened Lesson 3? It was fantastic. You got a five? That's, a, you know, that's amazing. What happened? And the parents can be part of that journey. So we've got, we've got all this stuff in terms of data going on. Now, in addition to the data feedback we get, schools are emotional hotbeds. Schools raise people's temperature. When you go through the journey of telling a parent that you believe their child has got unusual needs or challenges and you want to do something, there's something akin to the grief cycle happens. There's the denial, how dare you? 
is one reaction. Who do you think you are? There's the reaction of, oh no, collapse. You know, we wanted it all to be right because we love our children, we want the very best for them. That then goes normally through to, all right, we've roughly accepted, and that might take three, five, seven years, or ten minutes. Then, well, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to make it better? And then there's the hunt for resource and the demand. He's supposed to have. Why hasn't he? We need, and we've got to deal with that emotion, because the end point of the journey is that child has got to be independent of us and their parents in five years' time. So cuddling them and spending a lot of time caring for them in the five hours we've got to educate them is no good at all. And that's what most schools do, and that's what we were doing. This is an idyllic place. It's Iceland. I've been there a few times. This was in the summer, and this is taken... This I'm just going to reveal in a moment. This is taken... Um, there's a wall under here. This, this is the view out of a school in Iceland. You look over to the mountains there, beyond there, the sea, and then Greenland. What a wonderful place to be educated. <laughs> I think the thing to note here is we're getting somewhere, aren't we, because that's second language. Yeah? <laughs> Otherwise, there'd be those oblique lines through the O. But if you look up school, the purpose and the point behind the slide is clearly it's an emotionally charged subject. Everyone's got a view about it. What's the answer to that? You look at it, you make your mind up immediately, then you go back and you think, actually, am I right? Now, this is another uh, comment from Ofsted. I believe that the very best schools follow an agrarian model. It's about nurturing and creating the right conditions. I'm not the first. I've got, that's somebody else said that much wiser. But I believe it's an agrarian model of growing, not manufacturing. But manufacturing processes work really well on the production line that most schools are. Just... A couple more now. Um, when we worked with Mark, I don't know how well you know Mark, we thought, you know, it, it sort of brought the Buddhist out of me. I thought, you know, Confucius has come back. Um, if you know Mark, he came in with these, these long silences and um, this sort of upward looks, and we didn't really know what had hit us because we just talk fast and do things and hope they work in schools generally. And he was really quite data driven, reflective. Um, he thought, once you got the kids into the lesson, like you've done it really, you know, the engine's gone in the car, tick it. No way, that's the start, not the end. What's happening in that lesson, please? As you look at it, there are some kids tagged, one, two, and three. The teacher's looking at them. The feedback they're getting is from the child's face. Has he got his iPhone down here? Is he on Facebook? Is he reflecting? Is he puzzling? Is he bored? You're trying to read that. This young lady... What's going on there? And it gets more complicated when you slip into group work because peer learning, I love going in Apple shops, um, just watching people because there's something fabulous happens. The learning is quite electric. It's quite dynamic. This group here, what's happening? Who's learning? What's the one standing up doing? Is he part of the group? Is that a bunch of people hanging out together or is the deep learning going on? That's our real mission, to understand those things. I read The Toyota Way about six years ago. It's a big, fat book. Apologies if the author's here. Um, but I didn't really understand it, to be honest. It was full of graphs. The one I'd got was second-hand, so the pages were a bit yellow, so it didn't feel that exciting, really. I understood what all the words said and roughly what the graphs meant, but I didn't get it. I was fortunate enough, then, to go onto the Toyota plant um, with Ian and Mark and, and look at that. And after a week on the plant, I really, my understanding of lean was... It's about the ethos. It's about having the same set of values that we want to be here and we want to make it better. And to me, it was, it was really distilled down to that. We then went and looked at it in a school. And I have to say, I was a bit disappointed because you've seen the wedge of finance. To me, is why would you go and operate on a very small area when you could do, have a go at doing something big? So what we decided was we would apply it 
to a very large and complex problem, i.e. Sarah's department, and we would, we would take it forward. Now, this slide is quite precious to me. Uh, Andrew came into school with his mum uh, five years ago, or six years ago now, and he was due to go to a special school, a residential special school. Uh, they... <coughs> excuse me. Um, that'll spoil the tape. Um, the... <laughs> In residential special schools, it was, it was for autism, and the young person going there, his mother was distraught, she'd been to look around it, and she described this, the special school that he'd been designated as, she said, it's like an asylum, I want him to come to your school. So, so we talked for some time, uh, Andrew sat there quiet, and I said to him, in, in a patronising way, you know, what do you think will be the problem? And I'd left a timetable, a year seven timetable, which is a two-week timetable, asymmetric, with symbols. So you've got the, the room, the teacher's name, and then TX for textiles and all that sort of stuff. This lad, who'd been excluded twice, was dragged in by his mum to a school he didn't know and was due to go to a residential special school, 50 grand a year. So that's 250 grand it would have cost. And he said, I'm going to have a problem with RE on Wednesday afternoon, week two, because I don't believe in God. <laughs> Andrew, in the summer, and that's him, he knows I sort of stalk his progress slightly because I'm so proud of him, but he doesn't like it. <laughs> Get off. That's him on results day. GCSEs, history, A star, English, A, French, A, German, B, biology, A star, chemistry, A star, physics, A star, Maths, A star. Statistics, A. Took all the easy subjects. English Lit, A. That's what he got. He's in the sixth form. And I'm deeply proud of the journey we've been able to take him on and what we've learned from him, which we've transferred into what Sarah has done. So, Sarah, thank you. How are we doing for time? Keep it going. Yeah. Right. Give me one. <laughs> <laughs> Special needs. Thank you. Okay. So the lean story begins in um, January 2013 when Tony came to the department and told me that special needs funding was extremely uncertain and that we, as a school, we didn't have a clue what this could potentially mean for the department. <laughs> In June 2013, those cuts came, they were implemented. Tony came back to see me and told me, not going to lose any staff. However, you've got to get better, and not just a little bit better. You've got to get much, much better. You've got to do more with what you've got. The good news is, support's going to be there for you. And the choice for me was, did I want support from education or did I want support from industry? Toyota. Had lots of advice from education over the years. I've got a degree in management studies from Leeds. Never done anything with it since the day I left. Yeah, let's have a bit of industry. And to Mark Davis, who Tony just spoke about, senior manager from Toyota Lean Management Centre Deeside, with the there's always a better way philosophy. The initial meeting with Mark began with myself and my then line manager, Nick, amongst other things, talking about material and information flow and looking at diagrams like this one here. On that day, Nick and I both decided definitely we had now got special educational needs ourselves. <laughs> we hadn't got a clue how this could be applied to anything, anywhere, and definitely not to education. So later that month, Mark was coming back. On that morning, Nick called me to say, really sorry, Sarah, I can't make that meeting. So now I'm going back for another meeting, feeling like I was going on interview with a senior manager from Toyota to declare my ignorance yet again. I did, however, begin to understand that the starting point we needed to be at was to identify our ideal condition. We had to compare this with our current actual work, the day-to-day -day departmental activity, and it needed to be measured against industry standard, and we had to come up with a plan to close the gap. 
The big problem was we didn't have any standards, or we didn't know what the standards were, which in practice then meant that Tony, myself, my line manager, and our um, link governor, so our school works really brilliantly together with our governors, we had to sit together and we had to come up with job descriptions which would ensure that the standards required from the um, Special Educational Needs Code of Practice and the Ch Keeping Children Safe in Education Code of Practice, that we could meet those. So, this is essentially what we did. We focused on the four key areas, making sure we prepared our students so they were ready for higher education or other alternative successful onward pathways that they needed to be able to live independently, that they could relate to other people positively in society, and that they would be healthy emotionally, physically. Here's the safeguarding standards. Overall, to enable, obviously to keep the children safe, but to enable all children to have the best possible outcomes. We simply just merged them, and we created a job description which hopefully would enable the, di the, the desired condition to be achieved. These were the five questions we continually had to ask ourselves. When a student is statemented, so we have 11 statemented students at Criston High School, they receive an additional pot of money to, to meet their needs. We receive vast documentation from the local authority special educational needs team telling us exactly what we should be doing. And they stipulate a number, a specified number of hours that a teaching assistant should sit next to that child for. This practice continues and it's in spite of the fact that we kind of knew as a school anyway, but the Education Endowment Foundation, all their data is that teaching assistants attached to a child in a lesson is very, very high cost and very, very low impact. So we have to ask, ask ourselves, why then in Britain today is that still majority practice? The ideal condition is obvious. And as parents and for you yourself going through school, we need to design practice that allows us to develop all students quite simply to become qualified, to be independent, and to leave emotionally intelligent. And I'm sure you'd agree that a service that provides that is value. So, I could cope with this diagram. And I could definitely cope with the first stage, clarify the goal. We had a simple goal. It was to replace 10% of waste in our processes with direct value add activity. By stage two, however, analyse the current condition, the team met significant difficulties. The recording process felt horrific. It started off as a handwritten document, just write down what you do in every 15 minutes. It then became a form. It then became coded numerically. We were Kaizaning all the time. And it then became alphabetical as well, numerical. However, it felt completely out of control. We ended up with about 130 codes, there's 99 on there. 160 odd different things that the team were doing throughout the day. So it felt a little bit misunderstood and actually it seriously caused fear and extreme frustration in the team. The translation of lean to terminology from manufacturing to education at times felt impossible. There were disagreements between myself and my team of teaching assistants. There were heated disagreements between myself, Mark Davis and Tony. And amongst the team, there were genuine, genuine tears of frustration. Finally, we came up with those definitions. They're our definitions. You might disagree. So we broke this down now. These are some examples we came up with. Tony mentioned before lessons, not necessarily quality. So assume quality for all of those. We believe they are examples of direct value add in education. 
Access arrangement is for um, students to make sure that they can access their exams. They might be dyslexic, for instance, you provide them with a reader. This is what we decided was incidental. It was necessary, but didn't have a direct impact on the students. The seven mudder that you all know, the mudder of waiting, of correction, of overproduction, didn't really feel like they fitted in education. And with persistence, this is, this is what we came up with. And again, you may or may not disagree, and that's kind of where the frustrations came from. Came from. In reality, though, if we're identifying waste in our work, what if we identify too much waste? Fear sets in, and the team genuinely believe Toyota are here to cut manpower. Hugh Mark Davis to return to confirm to us this is definitely, definitely not the case, that it is for you to jointly identify the areas of waste and it is for you to jointly come up with solutions amongst yourselves. And the school had actually signed up to that. There was a contract that we had to sign to say that it was not about to cut staff. You're going to hear from one of our teaching assistants. Having been told by that her teacher that there were going to be cuts in special needs funding, being introduced to the lean process came as a bit of a shock to the team initially. The whole concept of lean management created a vision of reducing the team in numbers rather than actually supporting us. After an initial briefing with the Toyota manager, the team still felt unclear as to how the process would actually work and more importantly, how it would be a benefit to the department and the students. When we began the daily task of monitoring our every movement, we felt a bit uh, like we were being monitored, possibly to assess uh, potential weaknesses. Again, this led to a reluctance to engage in the first instance. One of the really great things about working with Toyota was that they did the data for us. So it returned back to us, and those were our 20 identified areas of waste. What was really powerful was it was there, visual for us to see. We had to believe it. However, as we developed um, more of an understanding of the process and the potential benefits, it soon became clear that it was all about improving our role, which would impact on the value we add, which would mean the students, were being, the students' needs were being met properly. When we analysed the data to determine waste or value, it really enabled us to establish what could be eliminated and how we could improve. OK. So with the data in hand, it was time to determine what we were actually going to eliminate. And these were the seven areas that, as a team, we decided we wanted to improve. Teaching assistants, there isn't a whole, um, there isn't hardly any training out there for teaching assistants in Britain. They don't get to go out. They don't get to come to nice hotels like this. We decided we made a great decision. We were all going to go away to one of the local hotels, and we were going to spend that day uninterrupted working on our ideas how we were going to improve the situation, how we were going to get rid of those wasteful situations, and how we were going to replace them with value-added activity. I'm just going to focus on two quickly for you. Um, access arrangements, as I said before, they allow students with special educational needs to access the assessment without actually changing anything to do with the assessment. So the current waste was that the students were being assessed individually and then they were, their papers were being marked individually, and it was taking a colossal amount of time from the lady whose job is to do the access arrangements, to test them, as well as it's her job to do the intervention with the students. So we, we had to get rid of that because she was coming off the teaching to do the assessments, and we needed her actually to teach because that's where the direct value add is. So it was quite simple. We looked if there was an online product that would do the majority of this for us, and there was. 40 hours work is now done in half an hour. She has 39 and a half hours extra. And it's not just 40 students, so this is repeatedly. She has lots of 39 and a half hours extra to work with the students directly. Phenomenal. Speech and language intervention sessions are for, often for the students with um, social communication difficulties. These are often written into the student statements that they must have this provision by non-specialists teaching assistants, they're not necessarily specialists. 
These sessions were happen happening during breaks or lunches or form times. The students never, or well not never, they, they rarely turned up, meaning that the teaching assistant was left redundant. She knew what she was doing was utter waste. The simple thing, put them into the timetable, make sure they are resourced, make sure the teaching assistants are trained, make sure we discuss what they're doing and that it's having any impact. It's brilliant. Lean did this for us. Why did Lean feel so good? There's that posh hotel room we went to. It was so good because it was based on actual data from our actual workplace, based on our actual processes and our actual practice. The team could visualize it and they appreciated and believed the facts of the matter. The full student services team worked together, but not just together with just ourselves. Tony came with us, our link governor came with us, my line manager came with us. We were all there together to design the solution. There was no fear. It is fine to talk about waste. It's brilliant. Every single day in our department, we laugh. We probably use the word mudder at least once an hour. We know what we need to change. The time was uninterrupted. It was great. We review regularly. I stamp my feet to make sure we have meetings regularly. We do. What you want to know, however, is, did it really work? Okay, so, a special needs teacher. I have zero knowledge of Excel or any data manipulation program. I had to persuade Mark Davis two years later. I didn't really have much contact with him. I had to persuade him and ask him if he'd actually do the data for me again. He tried to explain it to me how to do it, but he knew he was lost, so he just did it for me. I was genuinely really worried that when we remeasured that the data m might not show any change at all. It felt brilliant, but we needed the data, and there's the data. The value add has increased significantly, and waste has reduced. So what's, what's exciting me now about Lean Next? Well, as, as, you can imagine, as you know, I really enjoyed applying it to our department. However, we made lots and lots of mistakes in our application, in our, in just literally in how we managed to do it. So I'd really, really like to work with anybody who's a Lean educator to see how we can actually improve upon that process. We've spoken a lot about the fact that the teaching assistants in the classroom, the Velcro teaching assistant, that that isn't great practice at all, but it's still going on. We've got to look really carefully at how we add value. We know what that value is. Qualified, independent, emotionally, socially healthy. How are we going to do that? How are we going to deploy our teaching assistants in a different way when the local authority is still telling us it's 25 hours for that student, please, but we're going to do it? We've now got a model where majority time the students are supported in maths and English in their lessons and through a massive intervention program as well. But we're going to look at how we actually prepare our teaching assistants to deliver that support. They're not maths and English specialists. How do we prepare them? And how do we monitor their practice? Because unfortunately, that's where we're at still. We don't monitor their practice at the moment, but we will be. And we'll be looking for impact. We'll be looking for new key performance indicators. As well as being head of student services, I'm a foreign languages teacher and a dyslexia teacher. I'm really, really keen to get rid of waste in the curriculum. So when I'm teaching, I sometimes know, I'm not actually sure the kids need to know this. I want to look at writing a curriculum, a scheme of work that is value. And finally, the most exciting thing probably is for students themselves to apply lean processes to their learning. An average student takes 10 exposures to a piece of work for it to be absorbed into their long-term memory. So I'm not doing this 10 times for you, but there you go. So I hope that you can see how exciting this has been and that whilst we've only just begun to unpick the benefits of applying lean to special educational needs and to education, that it really does work. And I hope our quite humble stories inspired you to want to take this away and to take it into your field, to your village, to your school and support people to develop lean into education. Um, just, just to finish off, really, I, I feel that it's useful to share lessons with you. For me, it's, what's the driving question? The next area of lean we're looking at at school is science. What's it for? Why do we do science in schools? 
That's quite a good question, I think. And then once you've thought about it, the next question is, how are we going to do science if it stays? And these are questions we should be asking. I think the English education system is amongst the best in the world. I think the teachers are amongst the best in the world. It's constantly not, but what we do is not good enough and nothing like good enough. It belongs in another century. So we're having a go, um, building on some of the lessons, the particular those that I think they, they speak for themselves, but where we did go wrong was we thought it'd be best to become an expert for before we did it, and therefore we were doing two. And so what I've done in the next phase with the sciences is we've talked about the question, and I think what we'll do is marry the team that have already gone through the process, increase the understanding of the science department, and allow and support and give permission for that development to take place. Uh, and then, then we go into a better place. So, so that was important to us. We got ahead of them and they didn't get it and they all thought they were going to be sacked for a while. Um, and we haven't, which has been great. But things can land on our heads, obviously. Um, in terms of where we're going, uh, on a bigger scale, it's, uh, oh, that's the happy ending, by the way. We're nearly there for coffee. Um, that's Ted in year nine. And um, he's put his name down to go, we're establishing a studio school because I think it's easy to moan about stuff, isn't it? Say, oh, that's not right, that's not fair. But actually, you need to get up and do it. So we've managed to, um, we put a bid together in a very short period of time, put it through to the government. Bank of America, Merrill Lynch are backing us and they're really perplexed because they've been working with us now for two and a half years and I haven't asked them for a penny and they just don't understand because they're just waiting for me to ask them to get their checkbook out. But they've been great partners because they've enabled us to think about what are the skill sets that young people should have? What should a curriculum and learning look like? And we design, we've designed from ground up uh, I think we've got 42 students signed the admissions at the moment, so we're, we're racing on that. To open in 2016, a new studio school in central Chester. It won't be a school. It will be a professional place where young people and older people all come and do things together, and there's a lot of work-based learning which is embedded within the curriculum. We designed the curriculum on three pillars. We decided from a blank piece of, of paper given to some of my most talented staff, what should we be doing? They came up with logic, creativity and communication. And if young people have got those taught and worked with rigor, based in an employment context so they can see how it means something, and they've got coherent learning, which will be ratified in the highest stages by the International Baccalaureate Diploma and Career-Related Programme, then we think they'll have a great education which will lead on to in a lot of cases, free university degrees, uh, subsidised university degrees, internships with companies, and we're so lucky to have so many big companies in a circle and all these supporting SMEs in Chester. If you're interested, you'd like to know anything, you'd like to come and have a nose, you'd like to offer something, our details are on there. We'd love to share our journey with you. We're very happy. Mark it lean, and then it won't go in the bin, and, but it may take a little while to get back to you. We'd be delighted to hear from you, and we hope that, that some of the messages we've got apply in your workplace, or if not, you haven't been too bored. So thank you very much.